All right, greetings from the dark continent, conscious Caracol here, or Adams Van Sale, here to shine a light on the goings on down south. And again, tonight's topic is going to be broader than just the southern tip of Africa, but I'm joined by someone else that uh, also grew up here at the southern tip of Africa to talk about something that I think is becoming increasingly relevant, and that is how to invest in your community. And we're not talking about if you are if you just have a million bucks lying around, where do you need to uh, uh, send that money, or where do you need to donate that money not at all we're going to be talking about how you can even use something as small as a dollar or something as small as a 50 a 50 rand um to really uh, do your part towards building your community making your community strong and uh manipulating reality to a certain extent by uh, rewarding what you want uh, using your money to uh, reward the types of businesses and aesthetics everything that you uh, you want to see in the community around you so uh joining me here tonight is mr odin moja uh i think most of my audience will recognize him as a, a fan favorite here on the channel <laughs> friend of the favorite. show comes on uh, quite often and uh, he's now our official u.s correspondent proud Motswana, fine, whis fine whiskey enjoyer, an artificial intelligence expert, and just a top-class gentleman. And we're going to be talking about how you invest in your community. How are you doing, Odin? Yeah, wow, what an intro, bro. <laughs> Greetings from, from, the, from the free state of Florida, bro. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm doing well. By the, by the way, I think some people are going to be mad because I don't have time to do my own show, but I have time to be on your show. So people are like, bro, what the hell? But anyway, yeah. Yeah, just a little heads up. Uh, if you don't know, Odin's uh, show that he's talking about is the No Script Show that you can also find on your podcast platforms and on YouTube. Um, I think there's a link in the description as well. If there's not, I'll put in uh, put it in after the show, but I'm pretty sure it's there. So, Odin, let's start off this. This episode has been a long time coming. It's not just something huh. that I thought up uh, this, this morning. It's actually been a chat that we've had in person and uh, or not in person over in, uh, in private. And it's been a chat about the community and how you invest in it, but specifically about an experience that you've had uh, there in Florida, um, more specifically there in Tallahassee. And uh, mm -hmm. maybe you can give us the lay the foundation, give us the background, the 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 backstory, and the deepest lore uh, behind uh, today's episode and how we got here. Yeah, sure. It comes off of, uh, I guess, I, I believe it was a couple of weeks ago when I when I texted you. I was on my way back from uh, the south side of town and I was heading to my place and I was kind of hungry. I thought about dropping into Chipotle, which is a pretty massive chain here in the States. But there's this really cool, uh, I guess, hot dog slash, I do, I guess they do burgers, but it's really about the hot dogs here. A uh, diner place called Dog at All. Dog at All. Uh, but mm. we just pronounce it here in Florida as dog at all. Um, and it's, it's, it's an unassuming place, but it's been there for, gee, I want to say close to 40 years, 40 years. Uh, it's Chipotle. <laughs> okay. My bad. <laughs> Foreigner pronouncing Chipotle wrong. Um, Oddly enough, the, the my mispronunciation is not the worst part about Chipotle. It might be what it does to your intestinal system, but that's besides the point. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so Dog and All is this is this place um, that has been here. I want to say close to forty years, and it's literally and I and I had a chat with you about it, and I sent you pictures of it because it looks like what you'd assume an American diner would look like. Uh, let's say 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. It's an unassuming place, but the staff there are amazing. The food is amazing. The value for money is amazing. And it's literally just that one joint. And uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's a Tallahassee establishment. I think that a large part of the city's identity, even though it's one single establishment it's not even a chain in in their local area but i think that if it were removed from the map on that specific street a certain part of the city's identity would go and i said to you i think i said to you something to the effect of you know we have to we have to make these decisions consciously to to purchase from places like these rather than from you know 
Chipotle or, or whatever, which isn't to say you never should purchase from from these large chains. It's just, you know, like you said, you have to reward what you want to see more of in the universe. Mm, absolutely. And I mean, there's also a very uh, uh, important piece of context uh, that uh, we need to touch on. And that's the fact that the the lockdowns of the past two years just decimated small businesses. I mean, that's why you saw many of these corporations and uh, multi-billion dollar, dollar uh, multinational corporations just jumping on the political bandwagon, supporting all these lockdowns, saying like, no, we need to stay home. This, all, this, uh, all these draconian rules are necessary. And uh, then because uh, they could survive it, they've got the fat to survive the drought and uh, the small businesses couldn't survive it. All these big uh, corporations could jump through all the hoops, could fulfill all the criteria, they could uh, spend on all the different uh, uh, and new expenses that came with the lockdowns and the pandemic. The small businesses just couldn't do it. So, of course, they supported it. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a bloodbath for small family-owned businesses, um, many closing. I mean, in my own community, I saw many that closed their doors, not only do, just due to the lockdown here in South Africa, it's due to uh, the eroding blackouts, the load shedding as well. Um, but yeah, small businesses, even though it's it's almost I think it's a good example to use the the metaphor of the ecosystem. I mean, if you some of these very fragile ecosystems in the world have like, for example, one type of little unique plant that grows there or some small little rodent or lizard or something or butterfly that only only uh, you can only find there. But it's very fragile. If the if the ecosystem gets destabilized, that those little small unique animals get uh, get wiped out and they disappear, and the ecosystem just gets taken over by like the apex predators or the apex species um, that uh, can survive pretty much anywhere. So that's definitely a piece of context that needs to be taken into account. And you mentioned this when we were chatting. You said. Um, I mean, uh, you you pretty much brought up the fact that you saw all these businesses that were lucky lucky enough to survive the lockdown, and now still, um, the least you can do is to at least give them give them some uh, some support and some business. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to go eat your lunch there every day. Yeah, I mean, hey, I can make my own biltong, but I found a supplier here <laughs> to you know give me biltong. Yeah. So yeah, um, very nice. Yeah, most of my international audience has no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Biltong is what beef jerky should be. Biltong is everything beef jerky wishes. I have this dream. Uh, this is the one thing I love about capitalism is that it can take anything and make it, if with the right motivation, make it scalable and cheap and affordable. And it's a little expensive to get good quality biltong here. And I can make my own, but I kind of like the stuff that the, su the supply makes. I have this dream that one day some influencer chick cottons onto biltong and then she <laughs> makes it really popular. And then like that, capitalism will catch on to it. And and so I'm actually, actually, now that I mention it, I have seen some places like some chains down here, like Aldi have started stocking actual proper biltong on the shelf. So yeah. Hmm. Well, um, that's definitely something that I'd also like to see spread a little bit more. Um, but then specifically also, what you can also see in exactly what you just mentioned there is the fact that now you have the small business that wants to go out and start uh, cre uh, introducing Biltong to Americans. Now they create this little small family business and now you... Uh, uh, you just see it fail due to what I just mentioned previously. But you as a South African or the, the type of person that would appreciate what they're creating, you see the shop there. The least you can do is to go support them and to see if you can contribute to their, their longevity and getting established. You can see it like a small little tree that just uh, once its roots are deep into the soil, then it has a very strong chance of surviving. But it's still in, it, many of these small businesses are in a very fragile state, uh, especially when they only start off. I mean, you see very few uh, family businesses starting. I mean, many of them have a legacy of surviving through many types of crises. It's almost like they've built up a, an immunity, not an immunity, but they've uh, they've been tested and they've been found uh, not wanting. Um, but yeah, so I think it comes back to that point is when you see a business uh, either just uh, uh, producing a product that you need, but uh, on a small scale, on a local scale, you can see it's a family business or even just a, a local unique business that has a very uh, a, a particular aesthetic that matches your community and the type of aesthetic that you'd like to see. Yeah. 
I mean, that's where you need to go. That's where you need to at least uh, be be putting some of your money and your just your presence even sitting there will mm -hmm. will help that business. Yeah, I mean, I would say ninety percent of my my local watering holes that I frequent, you know, little bars and pubs are not chains in the city. Like, you know, shout out to the palace. Um, shout out to poor Paul's uh, in Tallahassee, Florida. I mean, there is a, there's a running, there's a reason why poor Paul's has this idea. I think they've been here for like 60, 70 years, something ridiculous like that. Um, and there's, there's a meme in in poor polls now that like people will come in and be like oh my my dad used to come here like 20 years ago like when you have when you have a something running that long that you know people's kids now come a generation later and they're still drinking at the same drinking hall that's something mm. really special yeah absolutely i mean that's that's how you build a community that's how you build an aesthetic i mean this is the sad thing when it comes to uh, this phenomenon now that we we see after the pandemic specifically this remote remote work so now everyone has realized in mass that they can uh, if they can do their job online they don't have to live in uh, in the city they can go live in any little romantic small town or yeah a beachfront property or anywhere with a uh uh postcard view and they can go sit there and do their online business but there's a threat that comes with that and a danger and that is the fact that they are moving to small little towns that have the people that live the, those towns are beautiful and those towns are nice because specifically people have been living there through thick and thin people have been working hard to preserve the community its values its aesthetics everything that makes it nice and then all these people moving in there to just pick the through uh, the fruits of intergenerational sacrifices they're coming to live there for all the benefits but if if any hard times were to hit or any type of crisis were to hit that community they would just leave uh, they, and uh, never come back and the they uh, would just be uh, benefiting. They would almost be like prosperity nomads. And that's what we're currently seeing, unfortunately, with uh, the, this whole new era of remote work. Is that It's nice. I, I give people the full rights and then people can go live wherever they want when it comes to if they want to go live in the countryside, they, they shouldn't be trapped in the city. But there should be some type of something that helps people understand why those places that they're moving to are attractive why are they moving to those places why not why are they moving to the small town and not to another big city what made that small town so nice it's not just the population density it's the type of in investment that went into that town and this is the type of investment what we're talking about here today is uh uh, supporting the the businesses that uh, contribute to the community supporting the businesses that uh, contribute to the aesthetic character of the community supporting those business owners that are uh, good members of society within that community that's what created those beautiful little towns that people are now streaming towards and uh, i think there's a real danger in losing a lot of that because now those towns are being flooded and those communities are being flooded by people that just are oblivious to the fact that what made them great what made them so nice in the first place yeah no uh, it's funny you say that i mean look i i have i have family in new york city um hmm. uh as in New York City, New York City, and not New Jersey. No, you're not from New York City if you're from Hoboken. Don't no, sorry. If you're coming in via a tunnel or bridge, you are not part of New York City. And that's not a bad thing, by the way, um, because New York City is a great city. It's just filled with New Yorkers, unfortunately. But to to my point, you know, I have I have, you know, family that lives in New York. Uh, great city. Um very high levels of prosperity um the the particular area they live in most people would love to live in they live in manhattan they live in a very nice part of manhattan the rent and property prices of where they live is sky high sky high even in dollar things and they're and they're only you know able to live there because of the high power jobs that they have but um you know I, 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 every time I'm there, I, I'm always aware that I'm only willing to be here in very small doses to live in this, this city in very small doses because there's just a certain soullessness about that city now, nowadays. And, um, my uncle, you know, who lives, you know, outside of still in, in New York, 
but like in the Catskill Mountains, um, purposely spends time up in the Catskills rather than in the city because uh, there's just a certain lack of flavor there. And he and, and to what you've pointed out about people who have sort of flooded these communities, he he the last time we were hanging out together in the mountains, you know, driving around and went to the local pub and all that, you know, he kind of pointed out to me that within the last three, five years, the character of the town that he lives in, up in, in sort of more rural New York, has significantly changed, maybe even permanently and possibly for the worse, because the number of people, I mean, up in the Hudson River Bay area, um, the number of people who have just flooded in from New York and city and New Jersey and Jersey City, Hoboken, all those kind of areas um, who have flooded in is incredible. Like they went for, let's say there is 1,300 people in that town. Now it's 1,500 in mm. the space of a couple of years. And and that's one thing. But what, what the actual issue is, is that of those 300 people that moved in, none of them have, you know, sort of acclimatized to the culture mm. of living in that town. Like he said, little things, you know, like people are weird. They don't say hi to you when you come over to them as neighbors. They don't wave to you when you drive by them. And that changes irrevocably. It's not illegal, but it, it irrevocably sort of changes the flavor of the town that he lives in. And, I, and once he pointed it out, I started to notice it like, you know, and this was also while we were at a, at a little restaurant who ironically enough, was talking about, you know, struggling to make it through the pandemic. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, community in a town absolutely is an ecosystem. And if you introduce, if you flood that ecosystem with a, a disruptive force or with a, some type of crisis or some just massive, let's say, for example, uh, a massive influx of people from the outside that don't understand the, the traditions or the, um, the culture of that community, it's absolutely going to shock that uh, that ecosystem, just as if you were to introduce some type of uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word now? Oh, some type of alien plant into a into a very fragile ecosystem, and it takes it over. But it it does the and you lose all that diversity. You just end up with like almost the 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 community starts uh, uh, resembling the. The place that the people that moved that flooded it came from rather than keeping its character and unfortunately that's that's happening quite a bit but at the same time uh, a good example actually is is yourself i mean you moved to a to a new community and to a new place but exactly the opposite where uh, your your uh, behavior is exactly the opposite is what uh, we've been describing your your behavior there is how you have been ex uh, uh, supporting the local businesses you have been taking part in the community you have been uh not just sitting at home uh enjoying the, the the fruits of that community and not contributing to it you've actually gone out of your way to invest in the community and to be a, a active member of it and to contribute to the aesthetics of it and you understand the traditions and you try to at least uh, try your best to understand the history where how the community became how it is and uh, uh you use that type of background i can pick it up from our from our conversations that you use that background to contribute to it and you are respectful towards the traditions of the the new place that you uh, that you now live in but unfortunately the opposite is also happening where people do absolutely don't do that but i, I like the fact that uh, i can use you as the example of of the opposite of what we've been lamenting right um and i and i will i will say um how do i put this you know aside from the benefit to the community of people acclimatizing i think that if you as an individual or a family or group take the time to be sort of respectful of where you move to and and, and acclimatizing to it you you too will also have an experience that is richer like i mm. have i like i i speak to a lot of other grad students who are you know from international grad students and you know they seem i can tell immediately because they seldom interact with the locals as much as i do um they seem to have been having a very different experience to me you know like they don't get invited to you know random house parties or to day trips down to you know 
uh, you know, St. Augustine or something mm. or to Fort Lauderdale beach or whatever, you know, you don't, they don't get this. And they're, and they're, they'll ask me like, how do you get in here? I'm like, well, it's, it's that simple. You have to, you know, avail yourself to where you live now. You can't, I understand like they have this, you know, global engagement office where, you know, you meet and have tea with other in international students. I understand how scary it must be to be on the other end of the world to everything you, and everyone you know, but you have to have the courage to take that step and actively immerse yourself. Because if the majority of your friends are other international students, then quite frankly, why the bloody hell did you come to America? <laughs> you should just waste your time. <laughs> hmm. I mean, even, even myself, I love whiskey. Um, but I have taken the effort to get used to bourbon, American bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> a true, uh, a true sacrifice. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. A sacrifice you were willing to make. Um, Gert Janssen van Rensburg says, uh, good evening to all citizens. Good evening, Gert. I like to see that, uh, that jij ook is. Um, I don't know. I wanted to uh, just uh, take the opportunity as well to just elaborate on uh, what I mean by investing in your community because we I've touched on it and uh, you've touched on it as well. But I just want to give some examples. So, and as, this is through what I've been doing as well. So, convenience is, and I'm I'm conv I'm becoming increasingly convinced of this uh, by by the day, is that convenience is just the devil's favorite uh, favorite tool to uh, tempt man and to send man uh, in to to tempt man closer to hell i'm pretty sure the road the the road to hell is paved with co or the the road to hell is full with filled with bait or the, the called convenience um and i think that's definitely something that uh touches or oh, that that connects to our conversation here tonight and that's the fact that it is much more convenient to rather just go to the supermarket or to the mall or to just the the mega walmart or whatever you uh, whatever the big supermarket chain is close to you in South Africa, it would be Spire or ShopRite or whatever. Yeah. And just to go buy everything there, everything from milk to bread to meat to brywood to everything, eggs, everything that you need, uh, just there in one trolley, uh, check out and you on, on your way. It's quicker. It's probably going to be cheaper because they've got uh, economies of scale. Um, it's, okay. it's every utilitarian speaking it's everything you you'd need if you're just looking for convenience and as cheap as possible but in the end you are letting all the other little uh, uh businesses in the area down because uh, they're being uh, suffocated by this massive just uh, uh um corporation that's covering everything so for example what I've been starting to do, and I'm increasingly doing it, is rather than buying everything at the supermarket, I go buy the things at the family-owned stores that I can. So, for example, the meat. Meat I go buy at the family-owned butcher, the small local butcher. Um, bread I buy at the local baker. Um, uh, any type of bry wood I buy at uh, small family-owned places that sell bry wood rather than at the, the tops or whatever. And uh, it goes on and on. I also try to uh, support also a Buddha market and a community markets where I can. Not the hipster type, like the really the, the, the market that's in the, 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 the backyard of the church, that type of market. We, I try to go there as, as often as I can. But that's the thing. You're, you're decentralizing where you spend your money rather than centralizing all of your, uh, your economic uh, activity in just one place, just at the one supermarket. You are decentralizing it to all these different other nodes. And there is a cost to it. I mean, they, they are definitely going or probably going to be more expensive, seeing as they don't have the, the, the economy of scale as a supermarket has. And then secondly, they are probably going to take, it's going to take longer because you're not buying everything in the same place. You're, you're driving or walking from uh, place to place. Now, in the old days, it was easier because you just walk down the main business district or road in your town and buy everything as you go along or probably as you walk from your way <laughs> to work. But now we live in the hyper urbanized and hyper motorized age. So you're probably, and this is the, the reality of it, you're probably going to be driving from place to place. So the cost that you accrue is the fact that you pay more and you it takes more time. But your the the benefit that you get, you can't really put a monetary value on it. And that is you live in a community that has all these different unique shops that you know what they're making is of good quality. It's and and they it's being made uh 
within some person's kitchen or in uh, within a family and it's being made um, not in some massive industrial factory. So I think th there's many layers to it, but that would be, uh, and I've, I think uh, what I would call it is just, uh, like I said earlier, the decentralization of your money the de or the decentralization of where you spend your money. Don't just spend it in one place or in one node try and spread it out as, as, as far as possible. Don't just uh, go, uh, if you want to uh, go eat out, just go get uh, food from the, the nationwide or global food chain. Uh, go to the, the family-owned restaurant, the pizza place, or the, um, uh, the, the, any type of uh, local restaurant or the bistro or the steakhouse or whatever. If you want to, for example, uh, and I'll, I'm not a person that goes out a lot to go eat out, but uh, now and then we do treat ourselves by going to a restaurant. And that, that restaurant should be a family-owned local place that's not part of some massive chain, um, preferably. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack there just to, for, no, you, funny, can, you uh, mentioned you Main can take Street. it from one point to another. Main Street, what you mentioned about Main Street, that the town my uncle lives in actually does have a Main Street. It's one of those historical upstate New York towns that actually does have a Main Street. But to to speak to your point about convenience, I think it's I will even expand upon that in, in what you said, convenience, like the devil's tool. Um, I would say that it's an offshoot of short term gains. Convenience is a type of short term gains, which is the general thing, you know, like in, in the sort of, you know, Abrahamic religion sense, um, you know, everything that ends you up in hell is based on short term gains and convenience is a type of short, short term gains. So I'll, I'll agree on that. And, and it expands even further, you know, convenience uh, when it comes to convenience, also short, short term gains, things like, you know, cheating on your wife is a short-term gain even if you can get away with it um when it comes to socio-political uh policies being written doing single variable analysis is a short-term gain so i would i would expand on convenience to even call it a type of short short-term gain uh yeah so hey sideline side line of opinions are you are you watching this while having a bride with like a double brandy and coke you better be bruh <laughs> <laughs> no, he's uh, he's always always tuning in, and there's a there's a great Get comment here from Gertjan. <laughs> there's a great comment here from Gertjan van Rensburg, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, Odin. So yeah. Gertjan van Rensburg says in the chat, "I shop at family shops uh, uh, as the big stores love the lockdowns. Yes, as we said earlier, as it killed the small competition and gave them a monopoly. Absolutely, it was the the last th two to three years." have been the biggest centralization of just uh, a monopolization of business. It's been actually quite, yeah. quite the thing to watch. And then he says, I go out of my way to support small businesses. I am a small business owner myself. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, on that, Odin? Um, I 100% agree. I would just add, and it was done. Let's never forget with the consent of the government, like people, you know, people are always like, Oh, capitalism, this monopolies. That. I'm like, Monopolies often happen because of some form of government intervention like this. The government created these monopolies because they gain from this. Let us never forget, you know, some governors were out dining at expensive chain restaurants in the middle of lockdowns. They This was done with government, like, large uh, complicity. Like, complicity, you know. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. Yeah. But I think that's the that's the weird world that we live in, the synthesis between big business and big government. I mean, we it's not just in the US, it's not just in South Africa, it's all across the world. We're seeing almost all across the world, we're seeing this phenomenon of the, the monopolies and governments uh pretty much joining forces and uh, creating this superstructure that's uh, it's almost impossible to penetrate or take on. It just it's too powerful. They've just become too intertwined and you see them completely walking in lockstep. That's why everywhere in from South Africa to the US to Europe, when the government yeah. doesn't even have to say jump uh, and the businesses say how high the business is just the government just sits there silently and the businesses, the big corporations come and say, well, you probably want us to jump. Well, we already uh, jumped as high as we can. I hope this is satisfactory. That's what we saw during the, the lockdowns and the, the most recently uh, is that we saw that the big business was more than happy. They were actually 
uh, that the government didn't even um, uh, ask them to. A good example was here in South Africa. I remember when uh, uh, the mask mandates were gone and you didn't have to wear a mask anymore. When I went to the, the shops, I still saw people wearing masks. I still saw uh, employees wearing masks. And mm -hmm. I told them, like, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. The, the mandate's gone. They said, no, well, it's a company policy. We've, uh, we've not been told that we, we, uh, we can't take them off. So the, the corporates were, were still enforcing these, this, this, these policies, even when the government wasn't even coercing them or asking them to. That just shows you uh, the point that we've gotten to, this synthesis between big business and big government. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, apparently, I was gone for a second. Did I cut out? It might have been oh, my no, it, it might. It probably was just a hiccup on one of our sides, but it's uh, uh, it's fine now. All right, yeah. cool. Uh, uh, I thought it was my VPN for a second. There. Yeah, like the government. Um, yeah, it works absolutely hand in hand with with big business now, and that's uh, and uh, I mean, I don't think that there's a chain store or like a chain bar. Like if I went to if I went to, let's say, TGI Fridays, for example, I don't think I could walk in there and order something and just get it. But if mm -hmm. I go to my local pub across the street, which, by the way, terrible for my diet, <laughs> the fact that I have <laughs> a sports bar across the street for me, but great for my right. Uber Uber bill. Um, it's not my fault, man. They had like $7.00. $7 frozen margaritas double two for one in a cup the size of my head like what what is i supposed <laughs> to do um but the point i was trying to get to also it's it's only it's only a drinking problem once you graduate when you're in college it's just called partying uh so <laughs> the the point i was trying to get to is that even that um and to sort of transition it to a, a point of how how big businesses and small businesses operate a difference is also in the level of trust in that we're building an ever trustless system in our society which is not necessarily a good thing case in point last night and pretty much every time i've been to you know the local pub across the street they don't need to run my card they know who i am they know where i live i don't need to run my my card like they know that i will tip and pay accordingly when i'm done no matter how trashed i get and everything is solidly done whereas if i go to a place i have to run my card and i would expand that trustless system even further to you know things like dating apps where you now have to meet romantic partners in a trustless system and you, you know it things have to get vetted through all these sort of apps and all that and it's yeah it's an expansion of this sort of trustless system that we're it developing socially hmm. before you, i want to stay on that topic uh sideline opinions uh reply to you Odin. he says i would have loved to bra on a tuesday Odin, but too much of a good thing is not a good thing absolutely fair. i agree with fair. that fair fair <laughs> uh but yeah brying is a great thing so on that topic of uh low trust and high trust i mean a, a low trust society is uh exactly what uh, it's good for uh, it's good for monopolies and for uh, for predatory corporates and it's also good for centralization and for for the state because in a low trust society you can easily if you're the state you can very easily sell convenience to that low trust society because they don't trust their their fellow uh, people in their community to be giving them services or to help them or to support them or to band together to solve problems uh, you rather just have the state uh, uh, do it for you because you can trust the government then also, it's also good for these corporates because if you have a, a low trust society where you don't have people that trust each other to solve, help each other solve problems, to band together, to solve the, the, the issues of their, their community, they can be preyed upon by, uh, again, convenience where uh, massive corporates can, uh, can swoop in and say, well, uh, we see we, you've got this problem. We can fix that for you at an exorbitant rate. And uh, you can't trust uh, your neighbor to help you with that. Uh, you, 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 can only trust, you can only trust my business or you can only trust uh, this corporation to do that for you. So it's good for, it's good for business, but the, the predatory type of business. But it's also good for centralizing uh, uh, power in the hands of the states, the, the low trust society. That's why both of those forces are driving the the increase uh, in low trust 
uh, rather than uh, supporting a community that's where that's increasingly high trust. Because in a high trust community, you don't outsource everything just to either corporations or to the government. You handle everything you, as much as you can yourself. If you need anything, for example, if you are in a, in a high trust community, you can trust that if you were to need uh, uh, anything from people in your street or from your neighbor, he will be there to help you. Uh, if you know, for example, your neighbor is very handy with plumbing, uh, you can trust that if you go knock on his door because you have a burst pipe, he can go come help you out with it. But in, the, in today's society of convenience, and uh, at the same time, with convenience comes just uselessness. Um, in today's society of uselessness and convenience, you can't just, and also low trust, you either don't trust your neighbor enough to come help you uh, fix your, your broken uh, burst pipe if you ask them, or uh, you don't, your neighbor probably doesn't know how to fix it either because he's also fell, fallen victim to the uselessness and to the, the convenience. So you have to either uh, uh, call uh, just uh, um, some plumber chain to come do it. Or if you uh, did what we've been uh, prescribing you do, and that is to support the small local businesses and small uh, local uh, service uh, services, you already have a, a good plumber on your on your phone that you can call that you trust will be able to give you a reasonable price to a very good job and will yeah. be able to service you as quickly as possible when it comes to fixing your your burst pipe or whatever the problem is. And that's that's the thing. When you do this, where you get your local butcher that you trust or you find uh, uh, a plumber or electrician that you trust or a mechanic that you trust, that's a family owned small local business. And you know uh, that uh, they 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 know you know that you can trust them, uh, and you've built a relationship with them. That means that you can, when you are in a in a tight spot, you can call them, and they will be able to help you. And you know that they will not um, they will not be uh, they will not exploit your desperation. Specifically, I mean, I know if uh, there's some situations where certain parts of your car break where you de you're desperate for a solution because you need that car to get to work, you need that car to go buy uh, food, you need that car. To, to get basic things that you need. And uh, uh, if you don't have a mechanic that you trust, for example, that you, the, that you have, uh, have built a relationship with, then uh, you will be exploited and you will be preyed upon. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you know me, I, I am a man of, of, of fine clothing most of the time. Um, I just, I'm just working in my, in my, in my bedroom slash office right now, but I, I trust, I trust blue ribbon, dry cleaners with with my fine suits and and coats and you know when they not say, a sponsor they go, uh no <laughs> not a sponsor uh but yeah no but it goes back to i trust it like i value my suits and i trust that that and then again actually it is literally a a family run dry cleaner i trust the oak who who, who maintains my shoes mm. as well that dude that oak got you i think 80 years ago or something like his family got you 80 100 years ago you know from 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 like Greece or something, and 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 it, generationally they've run the same little shoe store. So, and I trust that his he'll maintain my shoes. I trust the cleaners will maintain my 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 stuff pretty well. So yeah, and I trust that if if I'm in a bind, I can you know come in in our building here. You know, I I can trust that I can call on some of the oaks that I know in this building or or a couple of streets over you know to to help mm. me sort out whenever i need to sort out and that right. that's good for my spirit as well you know i feel more yeah. at ease and all that and that's the thing that's why it's so important to to decentralize these things and not have just the monopoly on 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 uh, or these types of monopolies because what happens is in a high trust small community that's uh, mostly local businesses if there's one business that's scamming people if there's one business that's uh, really exploiting people and not providing good service and they they're lying about the quality of their products or their products are of inferior quality or they're scamming people and they they're asking them way too much for their products that business will face consequences from that community that's how it's always been that's how you maintain or how that's how you deal with with uh, um 
businesses that try to mislead the public or that try to scam or exploit their customers without having the government uh, step in and asking the government to punish them or to regulate them to make sure that people aren't exploited. There's a, there's a natural mechanism for that in a small high trust community, and that is the community itself. I mean, uh, it, it's the fact that the butcher is not just some guy working for a chain, he is a guy that goes to church with everyone in the community. His children go to school with everyone in the community. He lives in the same place as everyone in that community. So he can't just go and, uh, and uh, for example, lie about the, the, the weights of meats that he's selling or mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, tell them that this is a certain type cut of meat, but it's not or any type of other uh, exploitation or fraud that uh, you can commit. Um, there will be consequences in that community for him, and that's what that's why it's it's important to decentralize this stuff. You can't just have these mega uh, uh, huge chains coming into your community and sell, being the monopoly on something. Yes, it's going to be the cheapest, probably going to be the most convenient, but you can't really have them face consequences. They they they've got a they've got enough money to burn basically when it comes to if they if they sell you an inferior product or if they exploit you if they uh, uh do anything to uh pretty much not or not contribute to your community you can't really have them face consequences they can just say well there's nowhere else you can go and uh, what you're going to do about it uh our lawyers are much more uh, have, a, have a lot more money than you a uh, small guy so that's how it goes and that's why it's important to uh to with everything that you have to try at least do your part towards decentralizing where your money goes rather than just throwing it all into one central point yeah i mean uh, you know and and i'll expand on that you know here in the state of florida we have these sort of sunshine laws and, and these public laws so like you can look up the salary of literally any education and i think any government employee in florida that's public knowledge mm -hmm. to everyone and it, you know, in my own town, you know, to your point of they know where, where the butcher lives, like everybody knows where the president of the university lives, you know, like he can't just, you know, screw over everyone and go like, we all know where he lives. Everybody knows where Ron DeSantis' house is, the governor's mansion is here in mm -hmm. Tallahassee, like you can go visit his house. I mean, obviously you can't just walk in, but you know, everybody knows right. where his mansion is, even the state capital, like every, that is publicly open to everyone, everyone, unless there is a private, like, uh, sort of secure state secret meeting, you, everybody has the right to walk into the capital. Everybody has the right to visit the, the governor's mansion and that keeps him honest. And, you know, conversely on the other side in, um, on the customer end of things, uh, you, you know, I, I would say everybody, <laughs> word gets around in, in Tallahassee, you know, like certain like student orgs, if certain student organizations or, or, or non-university organizations develop a certain reputation, that gets that gets spread around pretty quickly. And even on my side, uh, you know, in terms of like to what they're saying in the chat here, like I, I, I have a, even outside of my own sense of honor or religious persuasions you know i i have an incentive to keep my behavior in check because right. uh, uh if i if i choose to you know really get out of line you know i will no longer be able to just walk into the palace for example and, and have a dog like that that privilege will be very quickly revoked based mm. on 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 my behavior as mm, as yeah, you know yeah. just on the other side as a customer it's not just the seller that that has to be kept in check yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Gert uh, Janse van Rensburg makes a great point again. He says, um, I'm a one man to help a handyman service. I don't advertise and rely on service delivery in or and rely on service delivery uh, in order that my co uh, clients refer my services and promote my business. Yes. I mean, that's, uh, that's how I, uh, the, the local butcher that I go to, the local uh, mechanic that I, that I use that does an excellent service. Um, uh, just to, if you live in a, uh, yeah, if you if you live in a place where you can find those types of of services, you need to go seek them out. Um, I he I heard about them through word of mouth. I didn't uh, see some massive billboard next to the highway that said go to uh, this mechanic or to this butcher or to this bakery. I heard from people that uh, the, they provide excellent service, and they, and you can see through their reputation as well. They've been there for decades, and they they provide good service, and that's. 
that's how it should be. That's how you should be um, finding the businesses that you uh, that you uh, that you go to and that you spend your money at. Uh, keep your ear to the ground and listen to the type of uh, recommendations that you hear. And also, on the other side of the coin is if you know those businesses that you trust and those handymen and plumbers and electricians or whatever that you trust and provide good service for you, promote them to other people. If you hear about someone whose car broke down or has a problem with a broken pipe or anything like that, you can tell them, hey, uh, maybe try these guys. They provide excellent service and I have, I have no complaints. That can also be a way that you invest in your community just by spreading and upping their reputation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I found my, my cobbler and my shoe guy through basically through Yelp, which is sort of crowdfunded community ratings of businesses so you know yeah yeah all right so oh i see uh uh years is in the chat years says great conversation today i've been listening while working on things excellent thank you very much for tuning in years and I, i'm i'm glad that you find it interesting the last topic that i wanted to talk about odin uh, is something that uh, you brought up um when i was doing my chat with Oren mcintyre on his channel um uh, about south africa uh, and the uh, time to dig trenches and you were in the chat and we mm -hmm. were talking about just the context and then i want to hear some of your elaborated thoughts so we were talking about what for example the solidarity movement has been able to achieve with the universities we built and the the uh, uh, the, the the technical colleges we've built and the universities we've established um and everything else and i made the point that uh, you can't just rely on the profit motive alone that the free market will produce all of these services or things there needs to be some type of cultural energy behind it there needs to be something driving people to create what they want a good example would be uh if you are or live in a small town or community that has a museum about your town uh you shouldn't be relying just on oh well uh, if the if it's not making enough money it should close i mean if it's closed it's gone i mean then you need to organize as a community to support that uh, if it's that important to the heritage of your community or town and uh, you also you then in the chat made the point that uh, you should not be too quick to just say well uh, the free market in every sense is bad because uh, you can't just rely on the profit motive and we had a chat afterwards as well on it and we came to the the point where i think we we came to an agreement that uh, it is important mm. that the, the free market creates the space within which that energy can be uh, manifested and can be directed but uh, like i said as well to Oren, you can't just depend on the system itself there needs to be organization and there needs to be intent and agency to direct the the money and the resources in a certain direction and a good way to organize is through culture or through your community organizations yeah i guess i'll have to speed run this one uh but <laughs> you know the to, just to add my flourish to that you know um I, I also said something similar to Robert Deigen a while back is that, you know, um, con uh, conservatives have made the same mistake about the free market that that uh, aggressives have, but on the opposite end of the coin, the free market just is it's like electricity, the same free market that that provides for services like only fans and all sorts of questionable things um, is also the same free market that allows for um, from for things like you know what what solidarity is doing shout out flip based anyway um so yeah the free market just is and i think that's the and i think there's this general backlash especially on the conservative end against the free market and libertarianism and that sort of thing to just be like oh you know it's just awful you know to hell with the free market full-on protectionism i'm like no again you're making the same mistake just like we said it's it allows for that it, it just depends what you do with that with that that space and that energy and i think that we need to um you know still enjoy the free market but be realistic about what it provides for essentially mm. and you need to organize you need to uh you need to get energized you need to use that uh, that space to your advantage like i said you can't just depend on well there is a free market in place therefore the profit motive will just make everything yeah. That's that our community needs will just come to the fore. Some of those things people don't even know that they need. For example, like universities and beautiful streets and statues and trees 
a lot of people don't even know that they need them. So you can't put a money uh, value on them and you can't just expect some corporation or business to start doing it just because it looks nice or it creates an aesthetic or it, it makes people feel good. But we, we need those things and those things will only happen. Planting of trees, maintaining of, of uh, theaters and museums, building of statues. These are the things that you have to come together as a community to do. I've got a big, a big gripe with uh, conservatives in the U.S. specifically that uh, that look at, for example, statues that are being built. Doesn't matter. There's so many examples now that of statues that have caused controversy in the U.S. They always post the pictures incessantly everywhere and say, "Look how ugly the statue is," or "Look how ideologically charged the statue is," or "Look how unartistic and unesthetic it is," "Look how insulting it is to the eye." And I always ask them the same question. I'm like, every time that some statue is built by the people that you don't agree with or the people that you don't like, all you do is you complain about how ugly their statue is, but you never ask yourself how many statues have you built in the past exactly, decade? Yeah. How many statues have you built in the last 20 years that celebrate yeah. your values, that celebrate what you see as beautiful, that celebrate your history that you value and celebrate your community? Solidarity has built statues. Um uh, that's uh, we're we're building the things that are beautiful and building the things that celebrate our culture and our values. Why can't uh, why can't American communities do it? Why can't you build uh, instead of just complaining about the ugly statues that the progressives are building or the the just uh, uh, insulting uh, things that they're making monu monuments to? Why don't you build some small scale or whatever you can just build some statues, build some monuments, plant some trees, do things that represent your values. That's also an investment in your community. Mm. And I think that's that's happening. It's starting to happen in the US to a degree, you know, with things like building thing with initiatives like um, what's that university again? I think it's something valueless to you that it's like a, a, a explicitly you know sort of right-leaning christian university type thing mm. you know um and it's 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 getting there i think it's just they're they're just lag it's it's an example of again of what i say that south africa in many ways is like 10 years ahead of the us but in other ways 10 years behind you know in for, uh, you know in terms of economics developing our the economy of south africa we've fallen behind but in terms of cultural things we're like 10 years ahead with you know what with what solidarity and afroform are doing it's taking the us a while to realize that yeah we need you need to you know build what you what you need to what you value you know like i said mm. with that a liberty university is one of them as well you know build what you want and uh, you know you can and and there is you know a lot of these networks and stuff which mm. i i kind of sometimes cringe at like oann or whatever but at, at the very least they're building you know build your university, build your, your news network, build your, your town and whatever you want, you know, to celebrate. So I think you're right. And, and I think it, it's just going to take them some time to realize, you know, get over the impotent Twitter rage and actually erect a statue of your own. Mm, absolutely. And I mean, you can do it on small scale. It will be a, a victory in itself. Now, I, didn't, uh, I told you before the show started that uh, load shedding is heading my way. A rolling blackout mm -hmm. is about to hit a wave of darkness. And uh, I, I'd like to, to properly give you an opportunity to uh, leave the audience with a thought or with uh, any type of final idea. It's, it's the, the, the question of the show that I always try to um, incorporate. I often forget about it, but uh, I've now remembered. So, Odin... The, what I uh, would like to hear from you as the final thought is if you could leave the audience with anything this week to think about, to chew on, to leave at the back of their mind, could be a rhetorical question, could be a metaphor, could be a thought, anything. Uh, what It can be short, it could be long. What would you leave them with? I would leave them with the what I call the for lack of a nail situation, which is um, an old English poem which basically says, for lack of a what for lack of a nail the horse was lost because the horse didn't have the right shoes for lack of a horse the charge the cavalry charge for lot was lost for lack of the cavalry charge the battle was lost for lack of the battle the empire was lost and my point with that is this there's again it's is to circle back to what we originally started with is you don't need a million dollars to invest in 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 your 
community. You just need to make the conscious decision to go into that ma and pa store. So again, for lack of a nail, the horse was lost. For lack of the horse, the charge was lost. For lack of the charge, the battle was lost. For lack of the battle, the empire was lost. Mm. You making that simple decision is that lack of that nail. Mm. Well, that's the that's the perfect way to end it. Odin, thank you very much uh, for coming on to uh, share your thoughts again. Uh, like I said, you are a, a fan favorite. And uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for, for your time. And then uh, lastly, uh, where can people find you? Where can they find your work? Uh, at... Uh, on Twitter at Wotan Z A um, at mm -hmm. on on and there I think we have links to our own podcast that we do. You should come on again sometime. That's in the description. And yeah. yeah, and then I also I've also got into like video vlogging, streaming, and whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I, I I'll try put out good content, but again I, I I've made the vow not to put out content just for the sake of putting out content. So don't expect too many posts too often, but any sort of support and 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 you know general watching is always welcome so yeah hmm. all right excellent well uh there you have it and thank you very much uh, for everyone that's tuned in thank you for all your great questions and comments uh thank you also for your uh, your stories and your anecdotes from your your own experience especially you Gert, you uh, had some great stories specifically yeah. being a, a small business owner the, the exact type of guy we're talking about Thank you for your time. Thank you very much uh, for uh, all the great, uh, all the great comments. And I hope you have an excellent week, everyone. I hope you uh, stay safe and uh, that you have a great weekend. I'll see you next week when I chat to uh, Uist Stradom about Urania, a home for Afrikaners, and we're going to be talking about what the what the town is about. So I'll check you next week, Tuesday, seven o'clock. And uh, yeah, if you're new to this channel uh you can subscribe if you like these types of conversations and uh, yeah if you're not watching live anymore and you caught up afterwards you can still be part of the conversation by leaving a comment in the comment section i read all of them and uh, respond to as many as i can um so cheers guys have a good one and god bless